Welcome everyone to this interview with Thomas Earle on SOA and SOA certification. My name is Tim Warner and I'm a media editor with Pearson Technology Group. Our agenda for this podcast is as follows. We're first going to introduce our author, Thomas Earle, then we'll understand the basics of SOA, after which we'll dive into the SOA certification tracks that I really want you to become aware of today. Then finally, we'll look at self-study and instructor-led training and learning options for anyone in the SOA field or looking to be professional development or IT certification. About Thomas Earle, he is the world's top-selling SOA author. He's the series editor of Prentice Hall's service-oriented computing series at soabooks.com. He's the editor of SOA Magazine, soamag.com. He's the curriculum developer for SOA certified professional program. More on that later. And finally, although this is definitely not a comprehensive list of credentials, Thomas is the founder of SOA Systems Incorporated at SOASystems.com. So thanks for being with us today, Thomas. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure to um, have an opportunity to discuss this with you. Great. Well, without further ado, let's get started. The first question we have for you is, in information technology, we have such an alphabet soup of acronyms and industry buzzwords. If you could please tell us and our listeners, what exactly is SOA and why does an IT professional care? Well, service-oriented architecture um, is a style of distributed technology architecture that has evolved over the past decade from various other variations that resulted from the problems and challenges that organizations faced after continually building silo-based applications having a large inventory of the single purpose type of solutions and then having to integrate them and producing very difficult to manage point to point and convoluted types of integration architectures. What that trend often resulted in in terms of the impact on the organization was just an increased burden that the IT uh, enterprise would place on the evolution of the organization and the direction it wanted to carry out its business. And it often just led to this consequence where the IT environment itself would become more of a drain on the organization in order to maintain this larger convoluted type of environment and was less of an enabler for realizing business goals. And what was especially critical in those types of situations was that as the business had to change, or respond to change in its uh, industry or marketplace or, or climate, the IT support for that was often less than acceptable. It was difficult to respond to that change with these tightly coupled and, and uh, highly integrated systems and, and um, environments. And uh, they were also often fragile in nature and changes to them often resulted in reliability issues as well. So service orientation as a paradigm was basically inspired by those problems. It was a new approach to building systems and solutions that were inherently flexible in that they could be, they could accommodate change more easily because they were designed from the beginning with change in mind. So instead of building single purpose applications, we were building programs as units of service oriented logic that were inherently and intrinsically interoperable and that we delivered with the full anticipation that their initial purpose or that their utilization would change over time. And that formed the basis of the SOA movement. The SOA acronym became associated with that and is still used as the primary means of branding that architectural style, although that's had positive and, and, and negative consequences as well because it's really more than just architecture. It really is primarily about a design paradigm, a design philosophy that is referred to as service orientation, the architectural style itself is derived from that paradigm and, and that's how we end up with a distinct type of distributed architecture that we call service oriented technology architecture and which has very distinct and concrete characteristics that separate it from other forms of distributed architecture. Along those lines of distinguishing SOA as an architectural style and your remarks concerning the difference between SOA and service orientation. Is it too limiting to say that SOA is a framework or an architectural style pertaining to the software development lifecycle? Or can SOA principles be applied to other IT services, for instance, a service desk? 
or are those two different things completely? No, I, I do believe it goes beyond just the software development cycle. It encompasses a whole segment of the industry in that the paradigm that is at its core affects how we model, how we conceptualize services. It affects the methodology we employ to deliver services and service-oriented solutions, and it further affects the governance models we use to own and, and evolve our environments, our services-based environments, in response to business change. And so it really can influence a variety of different areas within IT, and it can even uh, affect the organizational structure of an IT environment because you now end up with services that need to be shared across different um, solutions, shared by different project teams, and so there are different types of roles and considerations that come into play that did not exist as much when we just had individual project teams deliver individual single-purpose silo-based mm -hmm. applications. But I guess the key area there to think about is the fact that one of the biggest challenges SOA has had is the um, misperceptions around what it actually represents. Early on, SOA emerged along the same timeline that the web, the uh, SOAP-based web services platform evolved, and therefore there was often a association of SOA with web services. Yeah. If you're building or using web service technologies, then you must be doing SOA. And that led to some negative consequences and some disappointment because there are a set of strategic goals and benefits that we look to establish when we adopt SOA, when we adopt service orientation, and that represents a very specific type of target state. And when we that target state cannot be achieved simply by adopting technology. It needs to be achieved by adopting the paradigm and preparing the organization for successful adoption and governance of what we build, and then choosing the right technologies to deliver those software programs with. So that led to some bad press and some negative connotation around the acronym of SOA. And there's also another myth that was originally associated with SOA that also led to some misperception of how it can be adopted, which is that it must be an enterprise-wide, top-down, waterfall type of approach whereby we need to transform the entire IT environment in order for adoption to be successful. And, and that simply wasn't true. There are various uh, scopes within which we can adopt service orientation. It can be within a segment of an IT environment. It, that segment might relate to a part or an entire business domain you might start by building 12 services or you might start by building 100. The key factor there is that the boundary, the scope of your adoption be meaningfully cross-silo but still manageable. And understanding that domain-based approach, mm -hmm. which originated with a pattern called domain inventory, is very critical to when you are learning about SOA and, and considering it and planning for it because it really allows you to strategize as to how and where you can begin manageable types of adoptions and even use that domain-based approach to phase it in over a period of time. So those types of myths and challenges have been associated with a misperception of what the SOA acronym stands for. And in a way, it was the confusion caused by those types of problems that inspired the SOA certification program, which mm -hmm. I know we'll talk about later. But mm -hmm. Education really is the key to overcoming those types of misinterpretations of what yeah. SOA is or is not, and also a good means of establishing clarity, especially across project teams and across uh, IT departments. Very good. So as we transition now from the basics of SOA into the SOA certification program, there's a personal note question. How did you come to specialize yourself in SOA in your career? Well. Our organization, uh, SOA Systems, has actually been around now for 13 years, I believe. Mm -hmm. And originally, we were involved in various technical committees with the development of industry standards when XML and, and WSDL and SOAP and, and other industry standards that laid the foundation for where we are today from a, uh, a web-centric perspective. When they emerged and, and they were just being put together and, and our organization specialized in providing uh, consulting and training services for those types of new, at the time, cutting-edge technologies. And through a series 